pleasure to have our lovely, my hubby, Adam King, painter here today, um, to talk about his work and his practice. And I hope you really enjoy it. Um, all these talks that we've had so far are actually on YouTube. So if anybody has missed them or wants to catch up on them again, just go onto, uh, onto YouTube with, with the name and um, you should be able to find, find it there, okay? Uh, okay, I'll leave That's you. fine, yeah. I'll just turn the lights on. I'm just going to be my assistant, so she's going to do the slides. Um, okay, when Heidi asked me to, let's say hello, first of all, um, I think most of you... <laughs> I think most of you... Okay, I think most of you here know who I am, but um, my name is Adam, I work at the college, I've worked here for, oh, I can't remember now, about 10 years. Um, like most of you here, I went through the system school and I went and did a foundation course. But unlike most of you, when I left my foundation course, I didn't go to uni. I probably shouldn't say that. But it wasn't right for me. And I actually wanted to continue with my own practice away from education. And I stayed out of education for 10 years where I worked. Um, I had a number of jobs I worked for. Um, Sotheby's in London, um, the fine art department. I work for Christie's and I work for Tenants. I wanted to, as well as doing my own practice, I also wanted to kind of get a lot of knowledge about conservation, um, auctioneering, and pricing of work, just so I could kind of broaden my knowledge about the whole art world. But at the same time, I was actually doing my own practice and I was doing lots of commercial illustration work, uh, lots of work for people like Athena in the 80s, um, but I'm not actually going to talk about that today, because 35 years of painting, you'd actually be here all day and you'd be bored to death, I think. So I'm going to actually start by talking to you about residences. Um, I found that once I finished a degree, which I did go back and do later, you leave your degree, you have a piece of paper in your hand, and you think, great, I've got a degree. And then you think, what do I do? I've got a fine art degree, what am I going to do? Now, somebody said to me, start applying for some residences. Residences are um, put together by institutions and organisations for artists. Residences can be in any format from hospitals, museums, galleries, ancient monuments, <coughs> institutions. And really what they do is they provide an artist with an opportunity to research, develop their work, and actually usually get some teaching practice, and then usually ending up with some kind of an exhibition. So for me, I'm going to start by talking about the first opportunity I had, which kick-started where I am now, which was working um, at York Minster. I got the opportunity to be artist in residence at York Minster. Um, now, what I was interested in at York Minster, I'd always had a fascination with history, architecture, and how things were made. Now, nowadays, if you're going to construct a building, you've got CAD, you've got all kinds of computer-aided design equipment that can enable you to, an architect, to draw up plans, and then actually to send the plans to the different departments to have it manufactured and to have it made. Now, in 1360, we didn't have any of that. They didn't have architects. They had what's called master masons. And the whole of places like York Minster, Fountains Abbey, castles and places like that of the medieval period, all had to be designed. And they were all designed by the master mason. Now, in order for them to copy, make tracings, of their drawings. They didn't have carbon paper, they didn't have photocopiers. So what they had was a floor, probably like this, and it would be thick gypsum plaster. And on the, what they would do is they would score, they would draw out each individual piece of stone using geometry. And it would be scored into the plaster. So you'd meet them, you leave grooves like you do in etching. Then they would cover the area in um, charcoal and then put wet paper down. Then they could pull that off and that would give them a copy of print. 
which then would roll up and you'd send that off down to the masons and then chip away and they'd make each section of the stone. So the job I had, York Minster is the only place in the world that still has the existing tracing floor. It's still there, it's been untouched. And for 500 years, this part of York Minster had been a storeroom. And my job when I arrived was to clear this floor, clear all the rubbish away, and suddenly you have this floor that has all these different markings in it. And my job was to copy exactly what was on the floor. So this entailed section by section with big pieces of paper, covering in charcoal and taking prints, putting these prints together to come up with this. Now, this is exactly what was left on the floor after 600 years. And every section here is of all the windows down the west transept of your minster, still there. So you can see you've got all the sections, you've got bits of stone, cross sections. So this would have been drawn, sent down to the master mason, he would have chiseled away and made the windows. Now for me, it was kind of a, ki a kickstart, because I was thinking, what a fantastic process. This is like printmaking. So I then, I think the next slide, the next slide is, this is, the, this is what the draftsman's floor looks like, just plastered with these big score marks that you can see, slight arches and things here. Uh, next. Um, so this was one of the first ones that I did. Now I had to first of all replicate a, a panel or a system where I could actually scratch into, because I didn't have a big floor. So I started experimenting with um, gesso which is uh, rabbit skin, like an animal hide, glue, mixed together with chalk. And I painted layers and layers of this onto large boards. I think these are, these are four foot, four foot by six foot boards, with 36 layers of gesso on. And then using standard geometry, drawing out sections of Fountain's Abbey because it's about the same period. So I was drawing out sections of stone that I found using geometry. This is like a base of a column. Um, these are the tiles to scale, all the tiles that were on the, actually it's still there on the altar piece. Um, so I was scratching those in, and then I was making a series of prints. Then you left with the boards, and then you start thinking, ooh, I've got all these boards with these fantastic marks on it to take these further. So then I started kind of experimenting and researching into medieval paints. Because when you walk around places like Fountains Abbey, York Minster, or even if you go around places like Knaresborough Castle, any medieval building, all you see now are bare walls. And you think that it was very cold, undecorated, but it wasn't. These places like Fountains Abbey, York Minster, things were covered in colour. They decorated everything. But they used, they had to use pigments that were found locally, because pigments are incredibly expensive in the Middle Ages. So the next one, I think, is, I don't know, is that a bit dark? Can you see? That is actually painted in section of that big print of the what's left on the board. So up here, you've got, this is the layout of Fountain's Abbey, with the pillars, the columns. These are in here, can we get the lights down a bit so you can actually see? Um, so it's painted in using um, raw ground pigments with egg. So I'm using what's called tempera, which is very, very kind of, it's like being an alchemist, that's better. It's like being an alchemist. So you're having to use uh, pigments, natural pigments, um, ground together with egg yolk and then meticulously painted on. Um, and then with over decoration on top using gold leaf, which is what they used in the churches. Um, so then from moving, for after York Minster then applied, they needed um, North Yorkshire County Council were trying an idea where they were going to open up a residency based at Knaresborough Castle. Um, so I applied for that with all this that I'd already done. 
Um, and I, luckily I got the job. Um, it was fantastic. You got, um, I got £10,000 for a year, free studio, free access, keys to the castle, everything. Problem is, you arrive as an artist and you have this big studio and it's all nice, you have keys, you have money in your bank for the first time ever, and then you think, like you all do, what do I do? How, what do I do? I've got all this, do I just paint pictures of the building? Do I start? So I then started to extend. So this, that's just a, this quick watercolor of the castle. Um, and then we'll move on. <laughs> yeah. So, Alston Resident Nesborough Castle. So I then started to do a series of panels. These are four foot square panels. Again, using the, all these marks are all using geometry. Scored in to very thick gesso and then overpainted with um, pigments and all of the colours, every single one of these colours that I, I did for the Knaresborough Castle uh, series of work are pigments that are found in Knaresborough. So the oranges you find in the cliffs where they've got iron in, um, everything there is actually that came from pigments in and around Knaresborough. So I used to go around the bag, take bits of rock out of the cliff, grind them up um, and then mix them with um, egg. Temperate. Very strong, very permanent, uh, but very laborious. Um, there was a say, this is a series of three, I've only got two left. This is a series of three based on um, a play which was called Three Knights in Knaresborough. Um, the three famous knights who actually murdered Thomas the Becket in Canterbury Cathedral um, escaped, ran away and hid in Knaresborough Castle. So those connections. All the time I was doing research and trying to piece together what I could actually, what could be the context and the theme of the work and how I could actually apply materials and techniques that I was wanting to use so it actually had a meaning. So there's a couple of heads still here. Now, right, this is um, again almost very similar to the one I did of uh, Fountains Abbey. But again, these are all cross sections of pieces of stone um, and tiles that are at, um, at Nesborough Castle. Next. On to the next one. These are, I really liked these. These are kind of like the side products. As I'd actually scored into these boards, I was making these prints. And I was using red chalks and black chalks. And I really like this idea of history, this idea of trace. You know, when we look at something old, it's kind of the things that are missing that really inspire us. It's the kind of the memories of what were there before, I think, that really kind of enthuse us as artists and trying to piece together. Naturally, your brain tries to piece things together, what things would have been looking like. And this is kind of a very natural process because when you're putting your ground up charcoal on your board and putting wet paper down, it's that accident. You don't know which bits are going to adhere and which lines are going to come out. So you get kind of bleeding out here and you get kind of areas that don't pick up here. And these are huge. These are, these are four foot by ten foot big sheets of paper, which are hung later. Um, and as well as doing that, I was looking at, um, these are all actual visible images of parts of the castle. So if anyone knows Nesborough Castle, this is the gateway. Again, in that geometry, marking it all out, using geometry, having to go back to kind of schoolboy maths to get all your angles. Um, lots of research into the mathematics behind um, uh, Gothic arches. I mean, it's quite complex. Um, and in fact, I actually found by the end of this series, I didn't want to do anything like this ever again. Because for me, the interest was actually in playing about with the materials. And then I found that once you'd scored it and drawn it, it was like, it was like painting by numbers. Because then all you are doing is painting in blocks. And actually, as an artist, for me, it is more about kind of the gestures, the marks, the moving. And this was kind of like, once I enjoyed drawing it, I was just filling it. And it was, 
for me, it was the art, I thought the actual artistic bit element had gone. Um, so I did, I literally did the whole of the castle. This is the undercroft using perspective. So this is very, very complicated because it's octagonal. And the stairs come down, there's a central pillar with these arcs that come out. And it's really, really complicated to try and actually do it on a square format because all geometry should, uh, it should be set on um, a standard uh, golden section. Whereas this is square, which is really complicated. But in addition to this, I included, like with this one, I think, um, this was actually, this is the, the cellar, the dungeon of Nazca Castle. And as you go down the stairs, there's also some fantastic graffiti, medieval graffiti that people have drawn onto the walls. And I included it because there's a frog here. You can just see the ribs and his legs. And I included bits of actual scratching in. And I think on some of the others, they had what were called <coughs> me, um, mass calendars. Now, you, we all forget that during this period, everybody was a, you know, religion, belief, was the whole element of life. And it, the life from day, day to day was governed by prayer. And so we used to have what's called mass calendars. You can roll on, it might be one of the others. Um, again, this is, another, this is another angle of the same room, but looking from one angle, looking out up the stairs where the graffiti is, and that one hasn't got the mass. Well, I'll find one with a mass calendar. Yeah, move yeah, on. Um, yeah, again, this is sections of Knaresborough Castle. This is the oriel window that overlooks the bowling green. Um, these are all different sections of stone that were found about. And it's just kind of turning them into compositions. Playing about with shapes, uh, colour. Um, yeah, next. <laughs> okay, as well as doing, in my studio, as well as doing kind of the alchemy bit, playing about with um, minerals and um, paints and pigments and different kinds of materials, I also wanted to do an installation piece because I was also very interested in the um, stratas, archaeology. You know, when, you, when, when you go to an archaeological dig, they dig down. Each layer represents a different period of history. So the deeper you go, the older you go in into archaeology. Now I just got something thought, right, well, that's fair enough, but what about us? What are we going to leave behind? So this was a community project where I got all the local schools in Knaresborough and Harrogate and I got all the kids to collect plastic things that they would throw away. Everyday objects, that's probably things that we're going to leave behind. And then I made um, concrete foot square sets and made, in the end I think it took on far too much because I had to make like 200 of these and they're all using different found objects so you've got mobile phones, you've got McDonald's toys, you've got Action Man, Cindy and then I put all these, I think it's in the next one, in, um, they were installed in the guard room which is a room in the castle and, and I put them down on the floor, covered them in, slightly covered them in sand, so when you first walked in, you didn't actually know that they were there. It wasn't until you looked down and you saw a Barbie doll and you saw a mobile phone. So it's kind of remembering, reminding us of what we're going to leave behind. Now, it's not as just as simple as carrying through a concept. It's kind of what we talk about choosing and selecting appropriate materials. The hardest part for me here was finding and sourcing a concrete that was the right colour. Because most concrete is grey. And I wanted something that was yellow, limestone. So I, I searched high and low, and in the end I had to get some uh, concrete which came away from the Isle of Wight, which gave a very, very similar colour. So when it was in the room, because you can see, you see this, this stone here, how it's very similar. So it meant that when you were in there, it didn't actually feel, you know, you didn't notice it. Um, I think when this went in the paper, this was called, you know, Adam's Modern Art of Rubbish, which would be quite... Okay, next, of 
kind of where we're going now. Right, okay. Um, so that's one series of work. Um, this next series of work is a series of paintings that I did about four years ago. Um, and they were kind of uh, systematic. They started as drawings and they were responding. I was responding to, I was back in my studio, I didn't have the inspiration of a residency, and it was kind of, what do I do? I'd been reading at the time a lot of poetry, a lot of First World War poetry, Siegfried Sassoon, Wilfred Owen, Rupert Brooks, where they kind of um, explore and kind of explain kind of the tortures and the torments that were going on in the First World War. Um, but also, which are very, very apparent to now and our lives. And I chose three colours. I chose black, red, and white. Because I just thought it would be much simpler. Because there's a lot of drawing. These are actually, again, these are on paper and board. They're um, six foot by four foot. And they started off by a systematic drawing after I'd read the poetry. There's text underneath here. Then I'd paint them over in whitewash and carry on drawing over the top, continuously drawing. And somehow, trying to kind of set myself like a, a, an experiment. You know, when do I know when to stop? You know, as artists, how do we know when to stop? Is it kind of, in, is it kind of confidence and intuition that says, right, okay, I'm finished now. I think we're happy. So this series of paintings was based on kind of struggles of war, and I was looking at mainly the aspect that kind of I think war is predominantly masculine, thing, very aggressive, most men. So it's it's kind of like these are kind of like manifested objects or figures that come out of the, the canvas. You really need to see it because they are very thick, layer upon layer upon layer. Interestingly, though, the red. Is, is, is the only colour that appeared after the First World War battles because of the red poppies. So for this kind of very apparent. So these are kind of a very, very aggressive, I think they're quite aggressive, and it was very much about um, the process and about the action of doing. You know, these were on the floor, I'm working all the way around this, and it's very action, you know, lots of kind of gest gestural marks. Now, let me this one. This is um, this is a, this is um, the scapegoat, um, which was mentioned highly in Secret to Soon. Um, saw himself as a scapegoat um, after being sent, given awarded the military cross um, for services in the First World War, but he threw his military cross very famously into the Thames. Mm -hmm wrote a letter to the government saying how this war was wrong. Um, and he saw himself as a scapegoat. Now, if you go back in history, scapegoat was uh, originally um, a Jewish um, idea where people would pin their sins onto a goat, physically write their sins, pin them onto a goat, and the goat would be sent into the wilderness, and all your sins would be forgotten. So I, this is like this is like manifestation of all those earlier paintings coming up with this form of the goat with the horn. This is big, big painting with text. There's loads of text underneath this. Um, this I actually entered this into the ultra open, um, and this I got this one, so I got first prize for this. So I was very pleased with that. So that's now in the permanent collection of um, Harrogate Museums and Arts. Um, and next. Right, okay. So, in addition to doing, setting myself projects, which I do all the time, set myself a project, I also do a lot of drawing. I draw every day, every single day, and I draw the world around me. Architecture, birds, flowers, people. And I have now, through confidence created over years and years, created like a way of capturing how I see the world in my own style. I don't use a brush. 
These are actually, I use a pipette. I use, this is Indian ink and a pipette, very systematic. I work really quite phonetically, quite manically really, usually listening to really awful, hardcore, rap, gangster rap music. <laughs> 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 um, so this is the Temple of the Four Winds, Castle Howard, really beautiful piece of architecture. Um, drawn and then washed over with different layers, different washes of watercolour. I use a mixture of ink. I use Indian ink, because Indian ink's permanent and won't bleed, and normal quink black ink that you write with. Because the quink <coughs> ink, if you, it's plain at the right times together, because the quink ink will bleed. So you get a nice distortion of the line, rather than the crispness of the Indian ink. I mean, you can see how phonetic that works on this. I've actually started here, and I think I ended up by going like that, with that line that goes like, can you see how the line? I like all my work, I like somehow to frame it at the end, on, on the proportion. I'm just going to run through a few of these. Flowers, tulips, again, tulips I have at home, I think I did that in about five minutes, very quick. Leaves. I did a whole series, I was commissioned to do a whole series of these ink and wash pictures um, of Leeds as it's developing. Um, this is Leeds Bridge, uh, and this is Leeds being built. This was done about three or three years ago. Um, and then these were actually, these belong to uh, 20 of these that I did for Leeds uh, Pensions Trust. Um, and they, these are only A3. But then these were blown up to this size. If you go to pension trusts, they're in there. They blew them up digitally, and they're enormous, hanging in pension trusts. Um, again, um, another architectural building. This is the mausoleum at Castle Howard. Um, John Van Gogh, one of the finest architects in the world. Looking up, love him, love his building. Um, I can't remember what's going next. Um, again, yeah, this is this is near my studio. This is what I see from my studio in Scarborough. This is uh, the Rotunda Museum, um, which is uh, again a fantastic building built in 1820, the first purpose-built uh, museum in the world. Um, again, very frenetic, um, working instantly on the spot. These are on the spot. I do not use photographs. I either draw and sketch on the spot, or I actually go back to my studio and rely on memory. So the one before that, the Temple of Four Winds, was actually gone back to the car and actually doing it in the car, drawing it in front of me, just from memory. Because sometimes if you trust your memory, it works. You're a lot more confident, you're a lot more happy with it. In my sketchbook, I might make the odd note. I might draw a box if I'm doing a building, and I'll put five windows, two windows, and a door, two chimneys. So that when I get back to my studio, I've got, I know the image because it's in my head, but if it's architecture, you have got to get the right windows. You've got to get the chimneys in the right place. It has to be the right shape. Because you can't say, then this is the rotunda. It doesn't look anything like it. But it is working on memory. Uh, again, at Scarborough, this is the Grand Hotel in Scarborough. Um, again, worked phonetically. And in fact, what happened with this one was, I was doing this in the car. And uh, as you can see, when I put this really wet, when I put this on, it all, it all started dripping. All the ink started dripping down. So I actually quite like that. So I then put some blobs on this side and then put the paper that way. And strangely enough, it gives you really good structure, really nice structure for architecture. And I just like the way it's just kind of instant, alive. Uh, yeah, watercolours. Yeah, I also do lots of watercolours. This is the uh, punk rooms, Harrogate. I put this one in because it actually shows every possible water, water material is in here. There is Indian ink, there is candle wax, which is the white, they resist, because obviously water and wax resist. Um, 
thrown on ink, and then on top of that, I think there are areas that after I've done it went too dark, so then I start reapplying bleach. Bleach is brilliant with watercolour. You can throw bleach on and it will lighten things if you've gone too muddy. So I think these dots in the sky, I think the trees are bleach. That's been bleached out, so I could lift it because it got too dark. So I needed to try and get the, the angle shape. So I needed to get those bits lighter so you could pull forward. Okay, that's next. Um, yeah, I also paint, this is large oils. I do lots and lots of, I love still life. Um, I paint lots of still life. It's a really good thing like self-portraits to do because subject matter is cheap. You can buy the flowers and you can paint them. Uh, this is oils. This is four foot by two foot. Yeah. Uh, don't know what that is now. Um, yeah, although I wasn't going to actually go into this series of work. I do a whole series of work based on martyrdom and piety. I'm, I'm probably coming across as being really religious, but no, not at all. Um, and I was looking at. Um, Martyrs, and in particular Saint Sebastian, who we all know was murdered by arrows for his belief. Uh, and I wanted to produce a really large painting, but I wanted to take out the arrows, as the metaphors, because the mess, their arrows. So I took those out and I painted this picture. This was done through sketches. This was done through lots and lots and lots of life, life studies. Um, this painting is 10 foot high by 6 foot. It's enormous. And this is in uh, a big collection in London now. And this, I went right back to where I've been. I actually made my own paints here. This is using raw ground pigments, but instead of wasting my time with the rabbit skin and the stink of animal rubbish, PVA. PVA and pigments. Fantastic to work. You can water it down, you can make it thick. And again, really quick, working on the floor. I always work on the floor. Because then you can work or you can walk all the way around it. You can sometimes look at a picture upside down. And does it work? Change your angles, move the marks. Yes. I think if you always work in the same plane, you're not actually changing, you're not actually giving yourself a challenge. And with a lot of these paintings, when I think I'm ready, I'll paint the whole thing over in white and start again. Somehow, those elements of history and trace pull the way through, so you can pull them back and get going on those. Um, I think we're moving on to... Yeah, well, this summer, okay? This summer, I did a series of 85 paintings, some of them on oil, and some of them on watercolour, and some of them drawing. Now, I put these in, really, because it's, a, it's almost a complete change. And what I was trying to do was think about my, my overconfidence, and think about not thinking about it, literally wandering around Scarborough, where I live, and every day, and coming back to the studio and thinking, right, what am I going to paint? And for some reason, this whole series of work has happened, and I've developed this kind of, like, these, are kind of these are characters, these are people that I've subconsciously seen in and around Scarborough during the summer, lots of people wearing vests, lots of tattoos, and looking at how that signifies. Has anyone ever seen, there's a very famous painting by Hopper called The Lighthouse, which is a, when you finish here, I want to go look at this painting, because it is classified as a, as a seascape, but there's no sea in it. The artist painted the picture of the lighthouse from an angle where all you're getting is the lighthouse looking inland, rather than what most people would think, have a lighthouse and then the sea. But you don't need to see. Immediately if you see a lighthouse, you, the signifier is lighthouse, sea. So these symbols that I'm putting in here, like fishing boats, uh, I should know I'm skipping because he's actually nothing to do with the white he went in. But yeah, fishing boats, striker tops, move them on. Um, yeah, fish. And this is just wandering around. This is just wandering around. Some of these, they're not as big. I think these are 
Um, portraits, I always paint on what's called a kit cam, which is um, a standard format, which is 3628. So obviously, whenever somebody mentions to you a size of a picture, if they say 36, they're always talking about the left-hand side first, as opposed to the bottom. So you know whether it's portrait or landscape. Um, it's Kit Kat. There was a, a club in London in the 18th century, a gentleman's club, called the Kit Kat Club. And they all decided that they'd have their portraits painted by Sir Peter Lilly. Um, and so the, Sir Peter Lilly painted every single member, and he painted them in, in a certain size, and he called it Kit Kat. So nowadays, when we paint portraits, everyone paints in what's called a Kit Kat size. Nothing to do with the biscuit. Okay. Um, yeah, just a series, of, this is just a series of characters painted very quickly, loosely, oil, watercolour ones. And, and that's it, okay. I could actually have gone on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> this is just touching the iceberg, isn't it? Um, any, any, please, questions? Ask me whatever you want, I'll try and answer. Somebody at the back. I can go back as well if you want to see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know when you said you were going around the town and painting all these? Yeah. Did you do it on a sketchbook or did you actually walk around like canvases and do it? No, no, no. What I said was that uh, this, this series of paintings from this summer was literally wandering around with open eyes, open ears, and an open mind. Uh, no pre-sketching, nothing. And then going back and doing it. Try and trust yourself to actually just paint what you think, rather than too much pre-planning. Pre-planning and changing, because that's when work becomes, I think that's when you lose becoming the yeah, yeah, spontaneous and being the artistic element about it. So nice to think, right, okay, I'm going to paint, and you do it. Not get too struck down. Good question, is that any more? Which um, uh, artist have you influenced you? I get a feeling that kind of national meets Jared Scarf and some of you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think um, uh, Piper, John Piper, I think mean, like, a lot of my building work. Um, a lot of the um, First World War um, artists, Nash, um, Nicholson. Ben Nicholson, I think, for materials, for the gesso, drawing onto gesso and drawing into that. Um, I think you take your influence everything, everything. I don't think you could, you, even an artist you don't like. I think, I think we all subconsciously take some, some research and some inspiration from that. Um, if I understood right, uh, some of the images that you showed us previously, you mentioned text that you then went over. Yeah. And I'm interested to know what that's about. What was the text leaf? Why you got um, it? What was it? It was out in the, the text. I think when you start, it's like, I think that was the red, white, and black war ones. I think when, you, when you're working really frenetically, really, really quickly, you know, sometimes you can look at text as marks. Mm. And, it's, and it's a really nice way you can get different marks, you get different kind of depth and quality by using text. And it is a way of filling in spaces. I mean, it's text in these. Images of these have changed and changed and changed until suddenly you find you feel it's right, the composition's right, it balances. But the text, I think that's also a way of me as the artist getting kind of what it is that this is about, and which poetry I'm looking at that I want to actually write down and then cover it up. So when you look at these, look at them really closely. I think the one scapegoat, which I think will be out next month at the Mercer. Have a look, you'll see all this text coming through. So some of them do actually allow... Yeah, 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 they, yeah, there's, yeah, there's lots of text, you can still keep bits of text coming through. So it's like that kind of graffiti. Yeah. These were also very inspired by modern day graffiti. <coughs> and that whole notion of um, palimpsest, you know, the idea of rubbing out, and rewriting over things. Um, and bits and pieces that come through in history. Any more questions? How did you mark into the stone? Pardon? How did you mark into the stone? 
Um, I didn't mark them to stay in. Did you not? No. Oh. What I did was, the early ones, if you go back to Mayor's School, what I did was, they used to, they scored into... I thought you made some small stone ones, though. No, no. Oh, the, 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 the floor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah, if you look at the floor very carefully, if we go back, there, that one, click on that one, Heidi. Those. Yeah. Now, if you look at them really close, if you go to the one bit previous one, Heidi, if you can. No. No, these are actual relief castings. Oh, right. Okay. So, what I would do is um, get a piece of clay, foot, foot square piece of clay, cockle it up, boards on the outside, and then press in the found objects to create a negative and then pour the concrete in, let it dry, and take the clay off, and you've got a positive. So I haven't, it, it, they are actual castings of the objects. Can you do it by yourself? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> no, again, it's a great so idea. We look good at the end, but you only have to make maybe 200 of it. Yeah. I was absolutely bored to death at the end of it. Okay, any more? Was it uh, deliberate to go square? Because I noticed on your earlier drawings mm. of the architecture, it yeah. square. Was that sort of like, I'm going to leave that composition behind in that really old? Yeah. Because they would have never used anything like that in them. No, they wouldn't. Um, square. I also, you know, after years of, of kind of practice and things and working too big, you find you can't reach across. If you work really big, you can't you know, physically. You can't you can't reach right across. So sometimes if you work on a square, it's really easy. Um, and the original way I started with those square panels was that they were going to be more abstract rather than representation. So I could work all the way around. And if it's square, it doesn't matter which way around it goes. But then naturally, we always end up going towards the representation, don't we? Any more? Okay. Okay. Well,